Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Shakespeare's Will by Verne Thiessen. Um, and this is another play that I'm reading out of Rick Knowles's edited collection, The Shakespeare's Mine. So Shakespeare's Will is a monologue play. And I have said this before on this channel, I'm not normally a fan of monologue plays, but I enjoyed this one. And actually, I've kind of, I've kind of realized that I've said that sp specific sentence enough that maybe I actually do uh, like monologue plays, and I've just been fooling myself. But uh, Shakespeare's Will is told by Anne Hathaway, not uh, not the contemporary actor Anne Hathaway, Shakespeare's wife from back in the day. Um, and it's the play is set immediately after Shakespeare's death um, and basically Anne is looking back on their life together now for those of you who don't know uh, Shakespeare was not a particularly good husband or father uh, he spent most of his married life away from his family in Stratford-upon-Avon uh, he was in London for most of the time so he very rarely actually saw his family. And, and I mean, there's some justification for that. He was an actor and a playwright and a member of a theater company. And London was where you made money doing that. But the evidence also suggests he didn't make that much real, uh, that much of a real attempt to actually connect with his family. And so we get a lot of that in the sh uh in Shakespeare's will. Um, so Anne reflects on their, like when they met, uh, their affair uh, that got her pregnant, which led to their marriage and so on and so on. Um, and she reflects on, and, and this is an interesting play because some of this is really historically rooted and some of this is more speculative. Um, so like she reflects on them basically on the night of their marriage making a vow and she says to uh, she describes this vow to live our own lives to treat each other well but allow for our separate desires to have our secrets but protect what we hold what we each hold most dear it will be our own kind of marriage and so that's a lot of what the play is about, is this their own kind of marriage and what exactly that means, because it's somewhat complicated. Um, on the one hand, this is a kind of open marriage, basically, where they each have lovers or probably each have lovers. Um, earlier than that uh, earlier than than their marriage um and had actually asked will if he was gay but i mean not she doesn't use the term gay because that wasn't really in in use in the 1580s um but she says do you i say do you what i don't know like boys a long pause here don't know you say don't know and i laugh and laugh don't know but then i see you're hurt it's fine i say doesn't matter doesn't matter not to me tell you a secret me i like boys too men that is i like the company of lots and lots of men why do you think i go to the fair so i mean there is a there is a substantial subset of shakespeare scholars who believe that shakespeare was gay or at least bisexual if not if not predominantly gay um and later there is a section where um there is a section where anne reflects that she'd heard rumors of his male lover in the city um and so that's a part of their their own kind of marriage and the whole idea of like respecting what's important to one another 
Um, and Anne herself has apparently had a number of lovers. Because um, at one point, she... Apparently there's a folk story, folk wisdom, that um, bees love gossip. And so if you tell your secrets to the bees, they'll produce honey. I don't know. I've never heard this before, but it shows up here. And so she's reflecting on this, these secrets that she's told the bees. Um, and she says, it's a funny thing, my friends. I've only now discovered being married, it is far more respectable to have many lovers. When you're young and active, you're called a slut or a whore or a strumpet. But once you're married, you're seen merely as dissatisfied or unfaithful or adventurous. Silly how we want to rob a young woman of her desire and make her unwhole. And then she goes through um, at least six lovers that she's had and so talks about them, uh, tells us about these different men. So we've got this element, um, but as much as there's this element of sexual openness between them, the other component of we have to respect what's most important to each other seems largely to come down on the side of Shakespeare, William gets to go to the city, write plays, be in the theater, etc., etc., and Anne has to accept that, even if what she wants is to actually have him there and have a, a personal relationship with her husband. So that's an interesting... It's an interesting tension there. On the one hand, there is definitely a patriarchal element here where what Will wants wins out in the battle of who gets the thing that they want from this marriage. Um, and at the same time, again, there is a practical component here because the city is where Will's work was and where he made a lot of money. London, London treated him very well financially. Um, and so there is that element of this is how you support the family. And I mean, again, it's a, it's a thing where it's not clear. It's not, it's not a black and white element, but it's definitely problematic. The other thing that I find really interesting about Shakespeare's will is the role of the sea. Because Anne is continually talking about the sea, continually talking about the ocean or water more generally. Um, the sea is what she really loves, but she also continually talks about rain. She talks about streams. She talks even about washing. Um, so her first line is actually, I long for the sea. And the first bit, uh, she says, I long for the sea. Her white toothed smile, her roaring laugh, her salt spray on my lips. The sea was a far better lover than you, Bill. When it had me, I was warm. I was wet and warm. But you, you were a rough, rocky shore, your head worn by tide, your beard straggly as seaweed, your eyes... And then a distant bell, and she listens. So this is an interesting opening line. And actually, there's a lot to say about this play from an eco-critical standpoint, from, from the standpoint of blue ecology. Um, this idea of the sea as lover in contrast to William, in contrast to Will, who is the rocky shore, but is also like the tide, is, is made up of seaweed, so he's intricately connected to the sea. the sea interpenetrates will in this in a way that it also interpenetrates anne but anne is distinct from the sea where shakespeare is in some sense aligned with the sea and we get that even more overtly later on because um so the sea for anne represents a degree of safety 
Um, and I'll, I'll talk more a little about that in, a, in just a little bit. But at one point, she brings their children to the sea. And um, Judith, one of their one of their daughters, asks what her father looks like. And she says, but what does he he look like really? And what they do, Anne and the children, is they collect up things from the shoreline to create a portrait of Shakespeare, of William Shakespeare. Um, so his face is as shiny as the moss there on the hill, and they all grab moss to create an outline of your face. His eyes are like two shining stones on the beach. Harry chooses uh, carefully chooses two, and Susanna places them down. His hair, what's left of it, they laugh again, is the, is like the scraggly seaweed there. Judith scoops some of the slimy stuff, and we fashion a wig for you, etc., etc. And it goes on. They 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 build a portrait of Shakespeare literally out of oceanic materials, and I there's a. In eco-criticism, there's a, a term for this. Um, I forget what it is. Um, I've written a paper about eco, about um, oceanic eco-criticism in, in Shakespeare's Pericles, and I could go back and look at that, but I don't remember what the term is off the top of my head. Um, but the, this idea that we are created of the oceans and that that there's a sort of intermateriality between humanity and the ocean between humanity and the natural world uh, more broadly but but ocean in particular um, because the ocean is where life originates on this planet um, and so there's this notion of the human as oceanic. And we really get that here. Um, Shakespeare, is, William, is presented as oceanic. And that's really interesting because of the way that the ocean figures for Anne. So Anne's mother, we find out, had died of the plague. There's very various plague outbreaks um, in the 15 late 1500s uh, from the medieval period on basically uh, there were various plague outbreaks Anne's mother dies in one of them and her father takes them to the ocean he takes them to this they abandon her mother's body basically abandon the house they go to the sea and they wait out the plague um, and her father tells them, No matter what happens, sweetlings, he says, when the wind is up, you move on. You always move on. And so, to save ourselves, he says, we must leave. Leave your mother. We travel to the sea where father spent his youth. He builds a small cabin where we are safe, away from the rats breeding in the walls of our house. We live there for three months, playing tag with the surf, building castles in the sand, the waves rocking us to sleep like she was our mother. So we have here, again, the sea representing safety, the sea also representing the sort of maternal force that looks after Anne and, and her childhood family. This is basically how Anne thinks of the sea. And so to have Will aligned with the sea is very interesting because it tells us something about the way that she thinks about him that he is in some sense a source of safety um, a source of protection etc etc but later on when there is another outbreak of plague in stratford upon avon Anne takes the the she thinks that the dog is infected so she takes the children to the sea to escape the plague, to escape the dog, etc., uh, etc. Et and what she says is Judith and Harry playing together in shallow surf. 
Judith runs in, teeth clacking like a skeleton, and I pull a blanket round her. I look up. Harry is now twenty feet out, waving, laughing. He mouths something, but the gull's cry drowns him out. I wave back, shoo away a wasp, and look again to see him gone. And I, I think, but where? Where? And I looked up and down the shore. But still he is, he is, and I just saw him. Where? And I run to the water's edge, call to him, and the girls, they splash in, and I say, no, there are currents, and I... I look for Brendage, that's their servant, to help, but he high on the, uh, high above on the cliff, and I call for help, but he cannot hear me, and I turn back, and I rush into the sea, my gown's heavy with water, and Susanna yells, no, mother, you will sink, uh, mother, you will sink, and so I tear it off, my gown, my shoes, my, my shirt, my shoes, my, trying to become a, fi trying to, to become a fish, to swim to you, Harry, Harry, and he waving goodbye like you at the road's end, Pack slung over your shoulder, waving, waving. For hours I hoped the, t the ocean would take pity, throw him up, spit him out like Jonah alive. And then she goes on for a little bit like this, but this is essentially it. Um, so, in reality, no one, no scholars are not really sure how Hamnet Shakespeare, which was Shakespeare's only son, uh, died. He died in 1596. We know that. We don't know how he died. Uh, it's possible that it was a disease. It's possible that it was a, of an accident. He was 11 years old. Children died in the early modern period at extremely high rates. So, and and actually there are a lot of people who argue that uh, plays like Hamlet reflect Shakespeare's attempt to work through the trauma of his son's death. In Thiessen's version of events, Hamnet drowns in the sea, uh, where Anne has taken them to escape from the plague. And that's very interesting, because in this case we have the transition of what the sea means. It ceases to be the source of safety, and it becomes the source of loss. But I also really like this line, trying to become a fish to swim to you. Because again, we have that notion of like transcorporeality in a way. Uh, this notion that like we are changed by our interactions with the ocean. And that's very central to, to blue eco criticism. Um, but this is complicated as well. Um, th so it's not like Hamnet drowns and Anne says, I'm done with the sea. Because when she finally reads Shakespeare's last will and testament, which she's had throughout the whole play and, and has been resistant to read, she finds out that all he has left her and this is historically grounded. All he has left her is his second best bed and the sheets that go with it. And she says, and with this you blame me, with this you punish me for their son's drowning. And what she says at the end of the play, what her, what her sort of final resolution is, is I will go back. I will go back to the sea to live like my father. I will go back to the sea to live where I last saw my son. I will go back to the sea to let the waves wash my wounds clean of consequence, of memory, of words. And that's essentially where the play ends. There's a few more bits uh, on here. Um, and actually, there's a, the, the very last speech... Um, or, or another part of the last speech is to hell. To hell with your words. Sink them in the sea, drown them in the depths, smash them on the shore, let the waves carry them where they will. Which in a way is reminiscent of Prospero's ending in The Tempest. Um, the promise to drown his book and, and have no more to do with magic, etc., etc. And of course, magic in The Tempest is, a, is aligned with words. Um, and so here we have that same kind of gesture. So I think that's really interesting that 
the ocean becomes both protector and destroyer to some degree. But even in the gesture of destroying the words, destroying what makes Shakespeare Shakespeare in so many ways, it liberates Anne. 